I'm Greg Dalton. I'm Ariana Brocious. And this is Climate One. As media hosts, we like to think that more information equals more action. But it turns out the way we behave is more complicated than that. Right. The way we convey information really matters and who the storyteller is. And climate, in particular, is a difficult and complicated story to tell. It's multifaceted. It has a whole bunch of implications. Right. It's so big, it's hard for us to see. It doesn't have a villain with a human face. That's why I so admire the work of Elizabeth Colbert. I read her book, Field Notes from a Catastrophe, back in 2006. She goes to far-flung places and witnesses the warning signs of climate change. In fact, that book is a huge part of what motivated me to create Climate One in the first place. It was such a compelling read for me. And 20 years later, she's still at it. She's been covering climate for decades, and I always look forward to reading her work in The New Yorker because I know that it's going to be a compelling, insightful, and well-written story that takes me somewhere and also gives me a real dose of reality about our climate present. In her new book, H is for Hope, Climate Change from A to Z, Colbert tries a different approach to climate storytelling. Right. It's written in bite-sized vignettes. You can jump into this point or that point, this letter, that letter. Though I will say it's not entirely hopeful. Yeah, because she's a realist and a journalist and she's been covering climate for so long, she knows the score. That's why I was so excited to talk with her for this week's show. And I wanted to start the conversation by her taking us back to her first trip to a weather station in Greenland in the early 2000s. Well, it's really as close as you can get, I think, without leaving planet Earth to, to being on another planet. It's a very other, sort of otherworldly experience. If you're actually on the top of the ice sheet, it's just white snow in all directions, just this vast expanse of white. If you're sort of closer to the edge of the ice sheet, then it's a little bit more nerve wracking, I suppose, because there are Uh, crevasses and all sorts of features to the ice. They're beautiful. They can be very beautiful. There can be these huge melt streams that are this fantastic color blue. And these moulins, which are these just holes that develop in the ice where ice water just drops many, many thousands of feet. But being near one, and I have been very near one, is a bit nerve wracking. I mean, I'm curious, you've been back several times since that first trip. What changes have you observed? Have you seen sort of with your own eyes the impacts of climate change? Well, I don't want to, you know, say that I've seen with my own eyes because I'm not a native Greenlander, but the Greenlanders who I speak to will tell you there are immense changes that they have seen in the course of, you know, just the last couple of decades. And I'll give you one example. There's a town called Alulasat, which is uh, on Greenland's west coast, and it's at the outlet of this large ice stream. It's where these huge icebergs break off, fantastically beautiful. And two things that people in that town have noticed, first off, that the icebergs, which are still quite huge, have gotten smaller over time. Their elevation has just dropped, so their size has has dropped. And secondly, this bay, this huge bay, it's called Disco Bay, used to freeze over in the winter and people ran dog sleds over it. Uh, And now it doesn't freeze. And so that's a huge, huge change, as you can imagine. Well, you personally, like many of us, have begun to witness some of these changes in your own neck of the woods. What have you seen from your home in terms of changing impacts, changing seasons? Well, anyone, you know, who's lived pretty much anywhere for a a couple decades now, uh, or even a couple of years, it sometimes seems, can see big changes. What I've seen, you know, in the Berkshires, I live in Western Massachusetts in an area that where we have a lot of ski resorts. They're having you know, tremendous trouble because the snow just, it's the season even of making snow. So a lot of these snow resorts used to run on natural snow, which would be really impossible these days. And even the window for making snow has really uh, crunched down to a very small window. Um, the maple sugaring is a, is a big, I don't want to say it's a big industry, but it's a lot of people maple sugar where I live. Um, that mm-hmm. window where you need these freezing nights and warmer days was always a pretty small window for sugaring, but now it's just moved up so that it happens now. You have, you know, April and now it's happening, can happen in the end of February this year. So people have seen really 
really big changes in seasonality. And that that's just true everywhere. Yeah, we've been hearing those stories on the on the show for the last several years, people really beginning to kind of understand that this isn't happening in the future, it's happening right now. You're a staff writer at The New Yorker magazine, and lately you've written about rising sea temperatures, unprecedented natural disasters like Hurricane Otis, and the ecological consequences of extractive industries. And to be totally frank, a lot of your reporting is a harsh dose of reality for where we are in this climate moment. And I'm curious how you hope your work lands with readers. Well, I I guess I'd say I subscribe to a pretty old fashioned view of journalism, which is that the journalist's job is really to report on what's going on. And his or her job is not to tell you how to feel about it or or, or not to even think about that, really. It's just to, to report the facts to the best of their ability. And so I guess that's what I'm reporting on, the facts to the best of my ability. Mm-hmm. Climate One co-host Greg Dalton interviewed you on this show back in 2017. You said that solving this problem, climate disruption, climate change, is above your pay grade and that you hope to inspire people to think about it, but you can't take responsibility for what they do with the information. We had a recent episode where we discussed this idea of a information deficit model of climate communication and how it may be insufficient since we've tried it for the last however many years and haven't seen a significant change in how people are necessarily responding to or perceiving of the problem. So at this point in your career, are you still convinced that that's the best path forward? Well, I think there are all sorts of ways to communicate climate change. I mean, there should be, you know, advertising campaigns. There should be a lot of other things going on. But I think as a journalist, I mean, once again, I I just don't know. I don't have the ability. I don't have the resources, to be honest, to, you know, test drive messages to go out there and say, well, would this story work? Would that mm-hmm. story work? You know, we're just not equipped to do that. We're, you know, sort of barely equipped at this point to get the information out. And You know, the information deficit model, once again, that's being challenged on all fronts and not to get into contemporary politics, but there's so many forces muddying the message these days for many times often highly motivated reasons. It's not entirely clear to me that we have adequately tested the information deficit model because there's still a lot of information deficit. But even if I had, you know, very clear evidence that that was not the way to communicate this message to motivate action, I still wouldn't have means to come up with a different way to do journalism. And, you know, I still think there's a function for the truth, even if the truth is not what it's going to get us from A to B. Yeah, I I echo that. There's definitely a role for the truth. Yeah, it's something we can all, I hope, get behind, but I'm not sure. (laughs) I want to get into your new book, H is for Hope. This is an abecedary, which is, you know, each letter stands for a word. It's a totally different format than your other climate books, which are longer journeys made by following scientists around. This one is a a short collection of essays on different aspects of the climate crisis that connect to each other in a really nice, longer narrative. So I'm curious why you took this format that differs so much from some of your past work. Well, I was really trying to do a few things simultaneously, and one of which was to sort of reanimate this story. I I do think there's a way that people, you know, sort of turn away from climate stories. They feel like they've read them before. What is there new to say? So sort of kind of break that story open and catch people off guard a little bit, I guess. But the other inspiration for it was that, you know, climate change is just such a huge story. It's not one story. If you follow even a really great, important climate change story to its end, you've only told one strand of this almost infinitely stranded story. And so I wanted to try to bring more of those strands together. And this seemed like a way to do that. And is part of the goal to be more accessible, maybe for readers who who are daunted by a, a longer book? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I hope that you could read this book, which is very beautifully illustrated by Wesley Osbrook, and come away once again in a pretty short sitting with a pretty good sense of the whole landscape, which I think is, is, is hard to acquire these days without reading several books on this topic. I think I like to think you could get a pretty good, you know, sort of quick background on climate change. 
I think that's true. There's a lot and there's a lot of contemporary reporting in here, too. So I want to chat about a couple of these vignettes. Electrify Everything, this is the letter E, details the plummeting costs and massive expansion of renewable energy and describes a not so distant future where the U.S. runs on carbon free electricity with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, electrifying our grid and all of our homes and cars is becoming much more possible. Then you have a later chapter, Q for Quagmire, which details the extensive problems and complexities with our current electric grid and permitting. So I'm curious, you mentioned this kind of multi-strand nature of climate, but how do you reconcile those two states of affairs? Well, that really does get back to you know, the basic issue here. And I think at one point in the book, you know, I say it's to say that enormous strides are being made and to say that almost nothing has been done. Both are true. And and that is another, you know, sort of message of the book. I think there's a tendency to want to tell one story that has a very clear, you know, either we're doomed or, or we're going to be saved. Stories tend to fall into one of those modes. And I think that the you know, truth, the awkward truth, the uncomfortable truth is that um, all of these truths are true at the same time. Right. So another pairing, if you'll allow me, of some vignettes is leapfrogging. So this covers the potential for parts of the world who have severe energy poverty to basically skip over fossil fuels entirely and move to a more resilient, ideally carbon-free system of electricity. Then the chapter shortfall describes the vast inequality baked into the climate crisis and the fact that the nations who've put most of the carbon in the atmosphere, the U.S., uh, Europe, Canada, uh, are not meeting their own carbon reduction targets and also very slow currently to commit money to help poorer nations adapt. So how can poor countries leapfrog over fossil fuel dependence without the means to invest in those alternatives? Well, that that's sort of the great, you know, question of our time. and. This idea that, you know, there's so much inequality baked into the climate crisis, as you say. And, you know, you can't really say that people who have not contributed very much to the problem, but who very much want to develop and, you know, reach a better standard of living, which in, in our, the way that at least it's been conceived in the global north is very energy intensive. So I think India is a very good example of this, now the most populous country in the world, relatively low uh, contributor to historical emissions, but emissions growing very, very fast. So if you were sort of, you know, the world as a whole, and you said, what would be the sort of cheapest, best alternative for the world, you'd say we should all invest in India so that India doesn't follow the same development path that the U.S. and Europe and China follow, which are very fossil fuel intensive. It would be in everyone's interest to avoid those emissions And that would be the cheapest way to avoid those emissions. But getting the world, you know, to agree to that and invest in another country's development has turned out to be extremely difficult, bordering on impossible. Right. We've seen the creation of a loss and damage fund, uh, one of the recent conference of parties. And there's been, I think, some perhaps some money allocated to that, but it is slow. It's not happening um, at the pace that's needed yeah, no, it's a, it's a, the loss and damage fund has very little funding at this point. But if you go back, there were previous funds, you know, that arguably have never reached what they were supposed to reach. But I think the basic point that this is very capital intensive, investing in clean energy. I mean, the, the good news is once you've put the capital in, then the fuel, quote unquote fuel, which is either, you know, the wind or the sun, let's say, is free, but the upfront costs are very high. And that's particularly difficult for countries, you know, that don't have that kind of catch. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about hope, despair, and everything in between with journalist and author Elizabeth Colbert. Coming up, we look ahead to the next era in our climate future, and it's clear that it's unclear. Now we are heading into, and I say this without fear of contradiction, a time of climate instability. And it's not at all clear, you know, what the limits on that are. That's up next. Please help us get people talking more about climate by sharing this episode with a friend. We'd also love to know what you think of the show. You can give us a rating or a review right now from your device. 
that also helps other people find the show. Hey, Climate One listeners, Ariana here. If you're looking for a podcast that dives deep into environmental issues facing coastal communities and beyond, then I'm excited to tell you about Sea Change, produced by our friends at WWNO New Orleans Public Radio. Their latest season, All Gassed Up, is all about the liquefied natural gas boom. Hosts Carlisle Calhoun and Hallie Parker start in the Gulf Coast and follow American gas around the world. Nominated for Best Green Podcast by iHeartMedia, Sea Change brings you stories that illuminate, inspire, and sometimes enrage, but above all, remind us why we have to work together to solve the issues facing our warming world. We have a lot to save, and we have a lot of solutions. It's time to talk about a sea change. Listen to new episodes of Sea Change every other Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. This is Climate One. I'm Ariana Brocious. Elizabeth Colbert's new book is called H is for Hope, Climate Change from A to Z. And it has a chapter for every letter of the alphabet, like C is for capitalism, J is for jobs, T is for temperatures. It's a clever conceit, and it also has a real narrative arc and flow. But there's one chapter that breaks the format, and when I encountered it as a reader, it sort of stopped me in my tracks. D is for despair. This chapter, if you want to call it that, only has two lines. It reads, despair is unproductive. It is also a sin. I found those sentences really powerful, so I wanted to ask Colbert about them and why she chose to format it that way. I think one of the, you know, advantages of this format was it allowed me to break the narrative in a way. And so I actually wrote those first four letters in kind of a a rush and got pretty quickly to D for despair. And then that's sort of a moment in the narrative for when we said, but despair is a constant theme in climate conversations and climate coverage. And it's a pretty logical, you know, response to the actual facts and the numbers, but it doesn't get us anywhere. So the point of that entry is to acknowledge that um, as a legitimate and perhaps inevitable point that you reach, but to get beyond that. Right. But we do feel, and we all feel, and it can be really overwhelming to contemplate the scale of what needs to happen and, and, you know, how little we've actually accomplished. So how do you personally balance those competing things of kind of hope and despair? Well, I never I, in any way hold myself up as a model of, you know, what other people should be doing. And that's both, you know, psychically and practically. And, you know, I wouldn't say that I have a good answer. And the last year, I think, has really challenged even those who would like to be hopeful. Just the data that are coming in are are really scary. They're very scary. There's just no other way to put it. You know, I, I like all people, I guess I live on many levels and in a, in a very long term and 30,000 foot level, I feel very worried, very worried for my kids, very worried for the world. And on a day to day level, like everyone else, I go about my business and, and live the life of, of right now. Yeah, I think that's something extremely relatable. And maybe that's the problem, to be honest, that we're all doing that because what we really need is to be, you know, just doing nothing but sort of focusing on uh, what we need to be, you know, doing the actions. And it's very hard to get the world's attention uh, long enough. You know, there's always another crisis that's intervening. Well, and there's the simple fact we all have these priorities. Those of us who are in the more comfortable parts of the world are accustomed to, to that level of comfort. And the idea of changing it, you know, there's there's this, I think, often false assumption that addressing climate means sacrificing, means having to give up things instead of maybe just tweaking them to a different way, which is the case in many circumstances. And so, yeah, it's a pretty complex area. We've talked a lot about it on Climate One. And I think you as someone who's covered it for so long, I'm curious You know, this has been at least two decades you've spent covering climate change. And you recently wrote an article in The New Yorker about last year's Canadian wildfires. And you you wrote, the unusual soon became the unheard of. So how do you grapple with this sort of unprecedented and even the term unprecedented, this new era that we're finding ourselves in when covering climate? Well, I think that is the really, you know, terrifying aspect of it. And I I don't think it's 
you know, widely appreciated enough, although maybe as more and more of these unprecedented disasters strike, more and more people are really coming, you know, up close and personal with the unprecedented. We can look at the climate of the last really 10,000 years in great detail. And we know that this moment that in which all of what we would call, you know, civilization has existed is a moment of unusual climate stability in the climate record of the last several hundred thousand years. And now we are heading into, and I say this without fear of contradiction, a time of climate instability. And it's not at all clear what the limits on that are. When you jack up the CO2 in the atmosphere the way we have, which really has you know, possibly never happened <laughs> before in the history of the world, that, it, that so much CO2 has been released so quickly, you don't know exactly what the impacts are going to be. And they could be sort of off the charts in ways that we uh, can't even anticipate. Scientists can't even, you know, exactly anticipate. There was a famous saying from Wally Broker, who was a very important climate scientist. You know, climate is an angry beast and we are poking it with a stick. We don't know the honest truth, I think, would be we don't know exactly what the climate system has in store for us. We can be pretty sure it has some pretty bad stuff in store for us, but it could be even worse than many of the modeling studies suggest. And I think climate scientists, particularly in the course of those past year, when we've seen record after record after record fall, uh, are starting to think some pretty, you know, are we missing something in these models maybe? And and that is a very, you know, it's just very scary. The unknown is very scary when you have 8 billion people on the planet who are sort of dependent on the climate as we know it. Right. And another theme of this latest book and, and a lot of your writing is this sort of tipping points, right? And that there's these kind of feedback loops where we may hit a certain point and others have written about this too. And then all of a sudden it's like we are, we've passed um, a certain you know, level of change and entered into a wholly new arena. Um, and that's, that is really scary. I mean, we don't know yet, right? Exactly when that might happen or. Yes. I think there's more and more attention on these, uh, I would, you know, sitting points, these points at which feedbacks in the climate system, it doesn't matter what we do at that point, these internal feedback loops will take over. And when I, you know, 20 years ago was first covering climate change. Richard Alley, a glaciologist from um, Penn State, gave me this analogy, you know, you, you, you are on a rowboat, you rock the boat, it goes back to the same state. You rock it again, it goes back to the same state. And you rock it enough and you get to another state, which is upside down, which is also stable. That's another stable state. So that's the big question. A lot of these systems that we, once again, depend on unknowingly have quite possibly two stable states. And we could be pushing some of them into the new stable state, which with which humanity just has no, certainly not in recorded history, has no experience with that. We're probably pushing the climate out of the state it has been since we as a species evolved. Right. So in this two decades that you've been covering climate or sounding the alarm on climate, how has the response changed the good news is that I think there's just much, much, much more awareness of climate change. When I, you know, first uh, started out, it was it was it was possible to find a lot of scientists, field scientists, who would say to you, "Well, I am not really seeing climate change, and I'm not convinced that these models are correct." You know, now if you go back and talk to some of these same people, and I have gone back and talked to some of these same people, they're like, "Oh yeah, absolutely, I'm seeing it in the field. There's absolutely no doubt of what's going on," and I think. That's true of the general public as well. Once again, it's just very difficult to avoid the signs of climate change these days. You know, everyone and many, you know, sort of ordinary activities as we were discussing, you used to go skate on that pond, you used to sled down that hill. Those are just not happening anymore. So you don't have to be, you know, much more than, you know, my kids, you know, kids are 25 years old. They remember sledding in the backyard. That was just a big wintertime activity. Very unusual that you can do that these days. I think. You know, you don't have to be a weatherman, you know, to know which way the wind is blowing. Yeah, very true. You won a Pulitzer Prize for your book, The Sixth Extinction, and the world has gone through several mass extinctions over its four and a half billion years. The fifth was that of the dinosaurs. And you say that humans are causing the world's sixth uh, and that as many as half the world's species could be headed for extinction by mid-century. 
But you also write about how humans reached Australia 50,000 years ago and wiped out species like the wombat, rhinoceros. So humans have been altering the world for a long time, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the evidence is pretty compelling that what's called the megafauna extinction, which is multiple waves of, of extinction of very large animals, or it's very selective against large, slow to reproduce animals that hit first Australia, then the Americas, then places like Madagascar as humans moved, settled in new places. So I think there's very good evidence that, you know, already 50, 60,000 years ago, humans were causing extinctions. I, I don't think that's, I mean, it is still debated, but I don't think it's really debatable. Well, the pace and scale has changed, maybe. Oh, absolutely. Those animals that humans wiped out, presumably predominantly through hunting, you know, that might have taken thousands of years to drive the, you know, uh, the megafauna of Australia extinct. Nowadays, we are watching many species go extinct in real time. I mean, I've spoken to, in the course of reporting the sixth extinction, I, I spoke to many scientists who had watched on their own watch, you know, they'd started out studying X or Y, and it had disappeared, you know, in the course of it, doing their, dissert, their dissertation research. So yes, this, the speed has increased, the rate has increased, and the sheer number and multiple classes of organisms that are being affected has, you know, shot up. In each of the previous mass extinctions, 75 to 85 percent of all life forms on Earth went extinct in a relatively short time. Do you think humans are going to make the cut of this next wave? Well, that that clearly remains to be seen. I mean, if you define a, a you know, a major mass extinction, and that is, the, as you say, the definition, basically three quarters as of the species on Earth being wiped out. That's a, fortunately a high bar uh, to reach. We are, you know, nowhere near that at this point. But if you look at the forces that we have put into play, it, it kind of depends how long are we at this uh, enterprise of transforming the world. And I think one of the important points to make, and it is another complexity or wrinkle, I suppose, on fighting climate change, some of the very, you know, uh, sort of solutions that are proposed or ameliorative measures that are proposed are very land intensive, for example. So, uh, you know, are you going to plant forests to soak up carbon? Are those going to be the kind of forests that the, you know, native wildlife need? Are you going to put down many square miles of solar panels to generate clean energy? Uh, is that going to displace a lot of the creatures that were living, you know, in those many square miles? So there are no easy ways out at this point. Many years ago, I read a book called The World Without Us by Alan Wiseman. And it was this thought experiment of if, if humans just vanished one day, um, how long it would take nature essentially to kind of reclaim what we've what we've done and it was really interesting and one particular anecdote that stands out was like the subway system i think in new york and how quickly it would flood the things that we have to do to actually keep them functioning pumping out the water and so forth obviously that's not an outcome any of us are looking for but it is an interesting way to view things and i think can give us some perspective that though we feel really powerful and i think you you comment on this and in this latest book, this sort of hubris that we have as humans and our ability to control the world, um, that there is a limit, right? There's a limit to what we can do without probably resulting in our own extinction. Well, I think that one of our immense talents, or maybe our true immense talent is, you know, we're very creative and very resourceful as a species. That's how we got to this point. That's why there are 8 billion people on the planet. That's a lot of human biomass just to support and whether that experiment can continue at this level is, is really, you know, an open question. We are running many years ago, um, you know, one of the, Roger Ravel, one of the very first people to sort of uh, understand the significance of climate change uh, back in the late 50s, uh, said, you know, we are running a vast experiment which could never have been run before and will not be run again. You know, we 
we only have one planet Earth. And in multiple, multiple ways, we keep finding this. I mean, microplastics are a really good example. But we just did it. We just decided to make a lot of plastics. And that seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, but maybe it wasn't. And now there is no way to get rid of all that plastic that's on the planet. So we just keep doing this. We just keep running these experiments. Uh, let's see what happens. And when you think about it, you know, just on a kind of gut level, well, yeah, maybe it, you know, works the first time and the second time and the third time and the fourth time. But, you know, one of those times is probably going to have some pretty serious consequences. And we're certainly seeing that, you know, with our experiment of using fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So what do you most want readers and our listeners today to understand about where we're at in this moment in the climate emergency? Well, that sort of summed it up. I mean, we are we are in an emergency. You know, if I were um, just speaking, you know, one on one with with our listeners, we are in an emergency. I do think it's important that people understand that because I think that it changes your reaction to various measures that are proposed. If you say, well, as Al Gore famously put it, that would be inconvenient. It would be inconvenient to do X or Y. You do have to measure that against the alternatives. What are the alternatives? You know, so we've often had this conversation like, well. I don't want to do this. We don't want to do this. We don't want to do that. But the alternative everyone has to realize is change is coming. Change is coming at us in a big way. And we can try to manage that change or we can let, you know, it sort of manage us. From the book's perspective, the message that I want to leave people with, I, I would say, you know, introducing a lot of the many complexities of the issues without, I hope, uh, leaving people feeling completely overwhelmed. Part of the point of doing it is an illustrated book, too was, you know, there's, a, there's, I hope, a certain amount of fun and pleasure uh, in reading the book, even though the subject matter is obviously very heavy. There is. And I think you do kind of weave back and forth between more of the heavy things and some of the lighter things. So one of the chapter that I think it's H for Hope that really I found interesting was the iron rust batteries technology, which I hadn't even heard of and um, fascinating possibilities there. Yeah. And that company that I wrote about, so Ages for Hope, there's, you know, a, a section about many great new technologies that are being developed. And that company that I sort of did a mini profile of Forum Energy is building a plant, even as we speak, in West Virginia to manufacture these huge batteries that rely on this idea that rust uh, runs in one direction, but you can run it back in the other direction with energy that you have a sort of excess energy. Like if you have a wind farm, for example, some days you just have excess energy that you can't put on the grid. You can store a lot of energy in these you know, massive iron air batteries. And then when you need that energy, you can basically let the stuff rust again and run that mm -hmm. process and get the energy back out. So um, it's, it's quite fascinating and it's, you know, actually happening. When we talked before, you uh, said quite plainly that you do get tired of covering climate. Who wouldn't, right? <laughs> How do you take care of yourself, given that this is the, the job you do day in and day out? Well, I mean, I think that there are, at this point, thousands and thousands of people who are working on climate change pretty much, you know, full time. So I, I'm not exceptional, you know, in any way. Um, it's, it is something that, you know, haunts your, your, your days and nights has that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I guess I'd say there's a lot of people on planet earth right now who have, you know, very, very acute, are facing very acute crises and war and famine and, um, you know, terrible, uh, emergencies. So I don't, you know, I don't think it is productive or, justified, you know, for me to in any way, you know, feel sorry for myself because I'm thinking about, you know, climate change. That's, that's a sort of a, any, anyone could be haunted by climate change. And many, many, I think increasingly many people are as where we have this whole term, yes. you know, climate anxiety. So, you know, just count me uh, among the climate anxious yeah. And I also want to allow for the fact that it's OK. I mean, you can only live in your own experience. Right. And it doesn't discount the suffering and experience of others that's happening now. And also the reason that many of us are anxious is because we anticipate much more suffering. So um, there's real reason behind it. So. No, absolutely. I I. I'm not in any way uh, discouraging people uh, from feeling anxious. Believe me, I wish I'm honestly more I. 
I know that anxiety, you know, has a bad name, as it were, but I do think anxiety is a big, is a big motivator. We should be, you know, we should be anxious and we should be motivated by that anxiety. Elizabeth Colbert is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author of the new essay collection, H is for Hope, Climate Change from A to Z. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us on Climate One. Oh, thanks for having me. Hope, anxiety. There are so many feelings that a lot of us wrestle with when thinking about our disrupted climate, including grief. And of course, grief can manifest in a lot of different ways. Coming up, Buddhist sister True Dedication explains how she experiences that feeling and how she copes. My grief is also a mindfulness bell, a reminder uh, to keep that love alive and to do whatever I can in how I spend my time and energy to be a part of the solution. We'll be right back. Hey, Climate One fans, we have some exciting news. We are now on Patreon. That means that you, as a subscriber, can get access to Climate One episodes free of ads interrupting your listening experience. For just $5 a month, your Patreon membership also gets you access to our Climate One Discord channel, where you can discuss the episode with other Climate One fans and begin to build your own climate community. Best of all, your support makes future Climate One episodes possible. Join us today at patreon.com slash climate one. Greg, you've mentioned before that you have kind of a conflicted relationship with the word hope. Can you explain what you mean? I do have a complicated relationship with hope. I think hope can be fake and dishonest. A lot of experts don't want to say they think it's too late, even when they're really worried. They think we can't handle the truth. And so they paint a rosier picture of where the world's heading than they truly believe. And I think people can sense and smell that. Sure, but if we admit that we're doomed, that's kind of just like giving up, and that's not a motivating force either. So even if the situation can feel really bleak, I think hope can be a powerful emotion to keep people going. Sure, we need some of that, totally fair. But if they're not being intentionally dishonest, they're being maybe a little bit delusional. I get that. They need to convince themselves that the window hasn't completely closed so they don't get depressed and just give up. And you're saying they... But this could equally apply to us, right? I'm hearing you say this as someone who's been focused on climate 24-7 for the last 17 years, and you've talked with many, many climate experts and scientists in that time. So where do you put yourself on this optimism-pessimism spectrum? I'm all along that spectrum, depending on who I talked to recently, the last book I read, something I see in the news, how I'm feeling. Some days I look at the exponential growth of clean energy and I get really excited. Yes, look at those curves. We can do this. Sometimes I just get punched in the gut and go, oh, we are so doomed. That happened recently when I talked to a reporter who's covering Microsoft and how they're moving away from their sustainability goals because of the big, juicy profits of AI. I think, oh, capitalism's going to doom us. How about you, Ariana? I haven't been covering climate as long as you. So I think in a way you could say I'm newer to some of the despair and grief that comes along with it. Um, But of course, I'm freaked out and depressed on a regular basis. The science can be really scary. And the more we learn, um, it can be easy to kind of want to turn away from that and just sort of ignore it as as something that we're not going to have to to face. But I also consider myself optimistic or maybe hopeful. And some of that's just my natural personality. But it's also because I have kids and I'm very committed to ensuring that they have a livable future. And so I don't feel like giving up is an option. No, yeah, that's a real privilege. And some, you know, Rebecca Solnit, who you interviewed, would say that, oh, some people have privilege to give up and we'll be okay. And I don't feel that at all. I feel pessimistic in the short term and pretty optimistic in the long term. Imagine the world we have once we get into place all the clean energy solutions we know how to build today. The whole economy changes to less polluting, less extractive system. Public health gets better. Energy gets cheaper. That's a world I want to live in. Journalist and venture capitalist Molly Wood can see this positive future. She created the How We Survive podcast for Marketplace. I am weirdly hopeful. I really am. I think that the the awareness is at a crescendo and there's a lot of fear and anxiety, but it is driving a lot of real change. And people are so ingenious. You know, it's really easy to think that our kids will live in this sort of terrible future because of all of this happening, but there's almost 
equally a chance that they could live in like an energy utopia. There was a great Bloomberg piece that was sort of a thought exercise in imagining what we could do with unlimited energy. And it's pretty remarkable to think what we could solve at that point. And I'm starting to see companies design solutions that are like purpose built for the cheapest electrons on the planet and even including the intermittency. So it's fine if the sun's not shining all the time. We've built a manufacturing process that that works with that and is phenomenally cheaper as a result. And I love the idea of just trying to change that mindset because it's in no way is it a barrier, right? It's just an enabler. Like for the, the 4G transition is a perfect example of what can happen when you go from scarcity. So we had a scarcity of mobile bandwidth on 3G and there was only so much stuff we could do. And then 4G came and an entire economy was built on top of it. Like apps that we would never think about being able to exist because there was just ubiquitous broadband access on our phones. Like if we started to think about what we could do with energy in that way, I mean, there's nothing we can't accomplish. Look, at some point, extinction is a really powerful motivator. We might lose a lot of humans before we get to the point where we have to fix it. I do not want to sugarcoat that. This is not a good, this is not going to be a good future. However, we're going to figure it out. Every time we have faced extinction before, we invented fire or the wheel or electricity or penicillin or agriculture, and there were terrible unintended consequences as a result of all of those things. But like we, the, the species, didn't die. I, I genuinely think we're going to figure it out. And I think the sooner we do it, the better off people really, truly could be. Molly Wood's views on this are really interesting, as is this idea that whether you feel optimistic or pessimistic can depend on the time frame that you're looking at. And I think the only caveat to that is that I don't want us to feel like we can be let off the hook for taking action today because we're projecting that things are going to be fine in 50 years or something. Right. And that's my problem with techno optimism or, you know, hope like, oh, it'll work out. I have hope, et cetera. Someone else will do it. No, we have agency. We have responsibility to do what we can. And that's where optimism comes in, because sometimes when I act, I feel like, oh, I'm doing something. It makes me feel better. Right. Action can really make you feel better. What else helps? What else makes you feel better? Taking a lot of deep breaths, mindfulness, slowing down, even when I feel urgency to act, which makes me think in this balance between hope and despair about how much energy and emotion we spend on attachment to the outcome of our actions. And that can be really draining. Okay, so you're saying it can be draining to be focused on controlling the outcome of your actions. But Come on, we're all attached to the outcome of our efforts. If we aren't attached to that, how do we find motivation to do anything? It, it is countercultural to think that, oh, we're not, we're not in control or uh, you know, to let go of attachments to outcomes or goals. We're so goal-driven as a society. Acting without attachment to the outcome is a real Buddhist ideal, and it takes some thinking to get your head around that. The key, I think, it's not giving up. It's persistent effort without being attached to specific outcomes. The control is an illusion. And I know that sounds radical or challenging. Yeah, it sounds hard. It sounds hard to actually do. Right. I got some insight into how to do it from a book called Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet. It was written by the late Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh and edited by Sister True Dedication. She's a fascinating former BBC journalist and now a Zen Buddhist nun in France. In 2021, I spoke with her about acting without attachment. I think even as Buddhists, we acknowledge the urgency of the situation. The question is, how do we respond to that urgency? And how can we get the strength we need, the insight we need to not panic? And I think what happens to a lot of us in the urgency is we're in a, a, a knee-jerk mode, in a reactive um, state in our own lives. And we just really have to remember that the activists, the scientists, the people who are working at the forefront of tackling the climate crisis. We're all human beings. And that urgency, we can't live in that state of heightened arousal. You know, it just can destroy our body and mind. So we are also part of the earth. And so we want to, to contribute in such a way that is sustainable and healthy for ourselves while we act urgently. And the power of Zen and the power of mindfulness is that it, it roots us in the present moment so we can be alert to what is going on. We can be responsive. We can be the master of our mind and awareness in any given situation. So we can really have the present moment as the ground 
for our urgent action, and that is action taken with clarity, with courage, with solidity, with freedom, and not with panic. It's about leaning into the feeling of fear and despair. And I feel like we all need a real practice to be able to not be afraid, not be afraid of our fear, to not be afraid of our despair and our anxiety, and to learn some really concrete practices to be able to acknowledge it, recognize it, and embrace it on a, on a daily basis every time it comes up. And more deeply, actually to lean into that fear and despair and accept that it is very possible that we won't manage to turn this around. There's a certain acceptance that can come with that and a certain peace and freedom. And it's like, all right, well, we've got nothing to lose because everything, you know, may, the, the odds may be stacked against us. And, and that can liberate us, I think, from the, from the panic and the anxiety to have a kind of peace, a freedom. And then all the action can come from love. We're not measuring the consequences of our action. We're just human beings, part of all the species on this beautiful planet, trying our best. That's a beautiful idea and an attitude I'd like to aspire to. But I imagine it's somewhat easier to hold on to that mindset while living in a Zen Buddhist monastery. What about the rest of us that live out in you know, the so-called real world? Well, I was actually at that monastery with her last fall and had taken a lot of those ideas out into the real world. Thich Nhat Hanh was a pioneer in what he called engaged practice that is present in the common world outside of monasteries. He wrote many books about applying Buddhist principles in simple and small ways in daily life and mainstream societies. Sister True Dedication says that all of us can take caring action toward other beings, whether we're in a monastery or not. It's not confined to that one area. And she says it can help counter climate grief, an emotion many of us are feeling more frequently in which we mourn the loss of natural beauty all around us. I do experience climate grief, that wonderful wo word, solastalgia. Hmm. I think I've been living here in Plum Village. We're in the southwest of France, the monastery founded by our teacher 40 years ago. And I've been coming here since I was 20, so almost 20 years. And uh, there are fewer, fewer butterflies. There's not the diversity of spiders. They can't grow the same crops anymore, so they're shifting to drier crops like sorghum. The creeks that used to run with water don't run with water anymore because they have to use all the water for irrigation. The trees struggle from the droughts that we've had um, in the last 10 or 15 years. So it's something that I am I'm witness to, just as many of us are, wherever we are, we're witness to the changes in the climate, to the changes in the biodiversity. I was struggling with this uh, a couple of years ago, so I decided. I needed to introduce some more elements in my day that were more proactive in terms of taking care of my environment. So my favorite oaks that I could see were struggling in the drought. Two years ago, I was able to harvest all the acorns that had started sprouting underneath these two mother oaks. I call them mother oaks. And uh, so I have uh, 40, 42 oaks uh, that I'm taking care of, which is, um, requires more attention than you'd ever imagine. Um, <laughs> But that is my, it's like a daily prayer to tend to them, to make sure they have shade and water and so on. It is a way of being with the world, which is myself becoming part of that nurturing. But I think it is very important that we can actively contribute to nurturing life in whatever ways we can. And, and I bring my grief into those moments. And this really comes back to this unconditional loving action and not measuring. At the deeper personal level, for me, my wish is to metabolize my grief into, into action. So it's to say, my grief, what's grief if not love persevering, right? This is a, <laughs> a famous line, I think, that um, came out in this year. So uh, our grief is a sign of love. And so for me, my grief is also a mindfulness bell, a reminder uh, to keep that love alive and to do whatever I can um, in how I spend 
my time and energy to be a part of, of the solution. And the oak saplings are such a wonderful example of metabolizing grief into action, as she says. And yet, I still have a little trouble wrapping my mind around this idea that you can act and not be attached to the outcome of your actions. I mean, doesn't Sister True Dedication care if her oak saplings survive? I'm sure she does. And she's able to pour her heart into caring while recognizing that all her caring may not succeed in the way she wants it to. But it's still worth the effort. Exactly. Acceptance is not resignation. It's not like do nothing, give up, it doesn't matter. It's about action without attachment. Someone who surprised me by espousing this is Reverend Lennox Yearwood Jr. I talked to him recently and his attitudes about attachment to outcomes are remarkably similar to Sister True Dedications. Reverend Yearwood is the CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus, which uses arts and culture to promote healthy communities and environmental justice. You talked about your willingness to give your life to this cause. And I'm curious, a lot of activists are attached to outcomes. We really got to achieve this campaign, you know, reach this number, et cetera. Are you also similarly attached to outcomes? No, that's a great question. I actually am kind of outcome independent <laughs> a little bit. This is where my faith comes in at. I have to do the best that I can do. I have to do it with integrity. I have to do it with the spirit of righteousness. And I have to do it with love. And if I do it with those things, I have to believe that the outcome that we will get should happen. But I also know in these battles that you sometimes don't see it. You're not always gifted to see what the outcome is or what it will be. And because of that, you have to be okay knowing that you may not see the outcome, but you have to know that you're putting us on the right path. And I think that we've seen that, right, with the civil rights movement. And we've seen that with the, the, the women's rights movement and the queer rights movement. We've seen it before when people didn't see the outcome. Um, they unfortunately never knew how it turned out. They never knew that one day there would be a black president. They never knew that there would be marriage equality. They never knew that women, well, would have rights and unfortunately rights, sometimes rights are being taken away. But they they never knew they would see that and, and never saw it. I have to be the same way. I think others have to be the same. We don't know, honestly, if we're truthful, if this world survives the climate crisis. But you have to believe and you have to be prayerful that you are putting this world and this cause on a pathway so that those human beings at us, they can come and say, thank you. You will never hear the thank you. You will never hear them say that we now have clean air, clean water because of those folks who lived back in 2023 and 2024. We now in you know 2074 and 2075, we have clean air, clean water. We, you, want, you may not be around for that, but you have to believe that there will be humanity after us. And because there will be humanity after us, it is our job, it is our destiny, it is our goal to make their lives better. And that's our show. Thanks so much for listening. Talking about climate can be hard, and we know it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. You can help us get more people talking about climate by sharing this episode with a friend or by giving us a rating or review, which helps others find the show. Or consider joining us on Patreon and support the show that way. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Ariana Brocious is co-host, editor, and producer. Austin Colon is producer and editor. Megan Basili is our production manager. Wincy Shada is our development manager. Ben Testani is our communications manager. Jenny Lawton is consulting producer. Our theme music was composed by George Young. Gloria Duffy and Philip Young are co-CEOs of the Commonwealth Club World Affairs, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton. <laughs>